this video, I'm going to be going over the first movement of La Flûte de Pan by Moquet. Make sure you stay tuned all the way to the end so you get all the practice tips and everything you need to know to perform this piece. First, let's start out with some background to the piece. So who is Pan? Well, Pan is a mythological creature. He is half man, half goat. You might have seen depictions of creatures like this in various pop culture references. But Pan is known for being a trickster. He's very mischievous and he is the god of the untamed wild. Often when we see depictions of Pan, we see him in surroundings of beautiful nature, winding rivers, and alongside many other creatures, such as the nymphs of the forest or the river. One important story about Pan is that he was one day chasing one of these nymphs through the forest and she ran down to the river where she met up with the other river nymphs. Now, nymphs have this uh, power to change into other creatures. And so the nymph um, asked the, the other creatures to turn her into something to escape Pan. Well, this didn't work exactly how she planned because they ended up turning her into a reed that you would find in the, the waters. So she was turned into this set of reeds and Pan was so mad when he saw this happen that he scooped up the reeds and fashioned them into a flute, which today we call the Pan Flute. And this is how um, the Pan Flute became to be known as Syrinx. Syrinx was that nymph that he was chasing through the forest and had her changed into these reeds, which then became this reed flute. This is why you'll find many flute pieces that have a connection to Pan. It's because of his flute playing. The first movement is titled Pan and the Shepherd. The composer included a poem at the beginning of each movement to serve as inspiration for the performer. Here is the translation from French to English. O oh Pan who lives in the mountains, sing us a song from your sweet lips. Sing it to us accompanied by the shepherd's pipe. So this provides a background for what the piece should sound like and what it should be depicting. Of course, with uh, Pan and knowing a little bit about his character, we want to incorporate that into our performance and interpretation of this piece. One additional interpretive thing that I'd like to discuss is all of the other terminology in this piece that is used by the composer. Everything from poco stretto to rallentando, diminuendo, and other terms that are in either French or Italian. Now some of these terms might be familiar to you and you won't need to look them up. However, if any of these are new to you, I would encourage you to look them up. Here are a few resources for how you can do that. One option is to go to naxos.com and scroll to the bottom of the page. Here you will find a glossary of musical terms under the Education and Resources tab. Another option would be to use Google Translate by typing in the term and either having them auto-detect the language or selecting the language if you know if it's in French, Italian, or another language. Next, let's look at some of the rhythmic challenges in this piece. One of the things that makes this rhythm so difficult is the fact that it uses three different divisions of the beat. So in just the first two lines, we can see all of these divisions of the beat. First, you have your eighth notes, then triplets, and then sixteenth notes. Being able to evenly divide the beat into these groups of two, three, or four is really important to developing this rhythmic accuracy. Whenever you're working on tricky rhythms, I think it's always a good idea to pull those rhythms away from the notes by saying them out loud and really getting a handle on how that rhythm feels before putting it with the notes and playing it on the flute.
One thing I encourage students to do when learning this piece is to practice it in 4-4 four, four, instead of 2-2 two, two, as the composer indicates. We're going to look at a few of these rhythms in the beginning of the piece in 4-4. Four, four. So if we start at the beginning, our first count would come in on the and of 4. Let's try counting the rhythms in bar 3 and 4. 1, 2, 3. And one and, and three, and one palette, two palette, three, and one. That should take you all the way to the downbeat of bar five. Let's try it one more time. One, two, three, and one and, and three, and one palette, two palette, three, and one. Once we get to bar five, then we've got to immediately switch to these 16th note counts. So the pickup to bar five would sound and one E and and three and one E and a two and three, one. Going forward to bar seven, we would have one and and a three and and a one palette, two palette, three palette, four and one and and a three and and a one palette, two palette, three palette, four and one and and three. I encourage you to work on these counts by saying them out loud instead of just trying to play through them. This will make you far more accurate technically and of course rhythmically. Next let's go over some of the finger technique challenges that we can find in this piece. Right away in bar four, we see this difficult passage in the high register that is quite a finger twister. I recommend always working within a rhythmic context. But that doesn't mean that you need to always work up to tempo. Of course, we need to slow things down often to figure them out. But always make sure that you're keeping that rhythm in mind. Here are eight practice methods you can use for measures three and four. The first way we're going to practice this is by playing it extremely under tempo and as lyrically as possible. Make sure that you are getting the very best tone quality on every single note. Repeat any passages that you have trouble with the first time. The next practice method is called slow notes, fast fingers. It's just what it sounds like. You'll play really slow notes. However, you're gonna make sure that your fingers are moving as quickly as possible in between notes. Next, we're gonna be slurring these triplets in groups of two. Dia, 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 da. Next, we're going to practice beat to beat. So start on beat one and go all the way to beat two, then play beat two to beat three. Next, we're going to practice this passage by changing the rhythm to an eighth note and two sixteenths. One and a two, two and a three. Next, we'll reverse that rhythm. One EM, two EM, three. You can also practice this passage by changing the articulation. Here, I'm alternating between all tongues and all slurred. Finally, you can practice by adding fermatas on any note within a beat. All of these practice methods just described here can be used throughout the piece. Just remember that you need to be keeping these in a rhythmic context throughout. The fingers work best when they understand the rhythm thoroughly. When students first look at this piece, probably one of the most intimidating parts of it is looking at that second page with all the 16th notes. Now, even though this looks really technically challenging, it really shouldn't be. All of these passages are just scales. So if you really know your scales well, you shouldn't have too much trouble learning this part. When we look at the first set of scales from the top of the second page until square two, this is just a C major scale. 
So it starts and stops in different parts of that C major scale, not always on C, but it is just nothing but that C major scale. There are many different scale patterns that can help you uh, build your strength and feeling within a given key. Here's just one example that I like to do with my students. This scale pattern was given to me by a friend who learned it from her teacher. A copy of this scale pattern in all keys is available in the description below. Here we're going to start with scale degrees 1 through 5, so the first five notes in C major. We'll play those over and over again until we get really comfortable with it. Then we'll go on to scale degrees 1 up through the octave to scale degree 2. Again, make sure you're repeating this as many times as you need to get it really even and very confident with the fingers. Then we'll go on to the next section, which is up to scale degree 6, or in this case, the high A. Next, you would work up a full two octave scale, in this case, up to high C. For this piece, we only need to go up to high A, but of course, it's always a good idea to expand your range and work on building this technique for future repertoire. That means that you should also practice this exercise down the octave, starting on low C. Once you have a really good feel for this scale pattern, it should be much easier to play the actual notes written on the page. They should feel a lot more fluid and even, and you should just have more overall control. Once we get to square two, we see a key change to one flat. However, this part of the piece isn't in F major or even D minor. Here, with the added accidentals, it actually becomes an A flat major scale. So I would practice that same rapid scale pattern, but just in A flat major. You can find this in the description below. For most of this piece, you'll be using thumby flat to create a really fluid and easy flowing technique. However, at four measures before four, we aren't able to do that. Instead, you should use the lever for all B flats in this passage. Then you can go ahead and apply those same practice techniques that we used earlier in the video. Here, I'm playing through this section very slow and lyrically, making sure that I'm being as musical as possible. I'm not concerned about the breath at this point, just about tone and musicality. You can try it with different rhythms, like this dotted rhythm, one, a two, a one, a two, a one. You can work on it going beat to beat with lots of repetitions. Notice that even though I'm putting in lots of pauses between each repetition, I'm keeping it really strictly in time. So very rhythmic. After I've practiced each beat going to the next one, I would start to link some of these together. in this piece that require special trill fingerings. In order to find the correct fingering, I recommend looking at this resource to help you find it. The Woodwind Fingering Guide can be found at wfg.woodwind.org. Here you can find basic fingerings for any woodwind instrument, as well as alternate fingerings and trill fingerings. To find the trill fingerings, select flute and piccolo, then scroll to the bottom of the page and look where it says trill fingerings. Make sure that you're looking in the correct octave. So for that E flat trill, make sure that you're looking at E flat in the staff 
and that it's going to F natural. Same thing at the end for that high F trill. You've got to look for a high F to G. That's the next note in, um, in, within the key signature. Next, let's talk a little bit about the breathing in this piece. On the first page, I think most of the breaths are pretty self-explanatory. We're going to breathe when we have a rest or after a dotted note for the most part. However, it gets a little trickier when we get to measure 16. Here, I would encourage you to take breaths after the single eighth notes that they have written in their original manuscript copy. Depending on the edition that you're looking at, you may or may not have a single eighth note triplet followed by five more eighth note triplets. To me, this is the way that the composer is indicating to the performer that, hey, it's okay if you want to break this here and breathe. Here's one example of what that could sound like. You can choose to breathe after really any of these single eighth notes. You just want to make sure that you don't drop the phrase after each of them when you take a breath. To do this, try and give a release to the note before the breath that lifts the note instead of stops the tone. First, here's the incorrect way to do this. Notice how short and pecky those single eighth note triplets are. Now, the correct way. It will always be a really quick breath, but as long as you get a nice strong breath in the eighth note rest, Prior to this phrase, you should be okay to make it with just these little sips of air. Next, let's look at the breathing in this passage on the second page. The composer has graciously given us several 16th note rests to breathe, but those 16th note rests are obviously going to be very quick. So you have to get really good at getting those quick sips like breaths in, as you're playing these faster notes. One thing you want to make sure that you don't do is to take actually too big of a breath during this section when you have several 16th note rests in a row. If you keep breathing in and taking in more air on each of these 16th note rests, you're actually going to be causing more tension in your body because your uh, lungs will be overfilled with air. If you have any questions or something that I didn't cover, please leave a comment below. I also hope that you'll take a moment to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thanks so much for watching. Happy practicing.